the hospital having my last baby. Uh, my three small daughters saw my husband almost killed across the street. And um, how was he almost killed? Well, uh, some uh, he was uh, in his car, and some uh, men were rushing uh, to the side of his car on both sides of it, and he managed to get away. Had you had any threats, uh, anything like this? Uh, had any threats? That's all I get is threats. I get uh, not less than six or seven threatening uh, phone calls every day. I was surprised to hear that the house had been bombed. But I was not surprised to know or uh, that it had been done by Muslims. Because I know that's the way they fight. I know that, uh, be that the case, it could not have happened without Yusuf Shah. Could not have happened. It could not have happened except by the Muslims that are there in New York. The Nation of Islam accused Malcolm of setting fire to his own home rather than vacating as ordered by the court. Later that day, the nation's representative, Captain Joseph, inspected the scene. Who bombed his house? I don't know. All we know, it just got on fire. Does Malcolm know who bombed his house? I don't know. He never said. And if he did, you know, he should, should have brought him to justice. There were news reports of threats against his life. Is his life really in danger? Maybe it was. He said it was. He said it was. Do you feel now that there was a climate within the nation itself that put his life in danger? Well, as you know, in the nation, you have all kinds of people. And they have different thoughts. You have sympathizers. They have different thoughts. You know? And you have people that are not, e not even attached to, to the community. That likes what they hear, but you just can't live the life. Anything might happen. That scare you. So anything could happen. The atmosphere was there. What was being said was there. You see? And you got to understand, you know, Mr. Muhammad and what he represented. That's what the people don't understand. I wanted you to know that my house was bombed. It was bombed by the black Muslim movement upon the orders of Elijah Muhammad. Now, they had come around, so they had planned to do it from the front and the back so that I couldn't get out. And the fire hit the window, and it woke up my second oldest baby. Uh, and then it, but the fire burned on the outside of the house. But had that fire, had that one gone through that window, it would have fallen on a six-year-old girl, a four-year-old girl, and a two-year-old girl. And I'm going to tell you, if it had done it, I'd taken my rifle and gone after anybody in sight. I would not wait. Cause in the, and I say that because of this. The police know the criminal operation of the black Muslim movement because they have thoroughly infiltrated. The only thing that I regret in all of this is that two black groups have to fight and kill each other off. <laughs> Elijah Muhammad could stop the whole thing tomorrow just by raising his hand. Really, he could. He could stop the whole thing by raising his hand. But he won't. He doesn't love black people. He doesn't even love his own followers, proof of which they're killing each other. They killed one in the brown. They shot another one in the brown. They tried to get six of us uh, uh, Sunday morning and... Uh, the pattern has developed across the country. The man has gone insane, absolutely out of his mind. Besides, you can't be 70 years old and surround yourself by a handful of 16, 17, 18-year-old girls and keep your right mind. You can't do it. My name is Gene Roberts, and I was assigned by the New York City Police Department to uh, infiltrate Malcolm's organization, uh, report back membership, names, weapons, if any. And I attended meetings and was part of the security on occasions. And at this particular meeting, I was standing up front along with about four or five other guys. 
Builder members. And I heard a commotion in the middle to my right. I started for the commotion and I see this young fellow come down the middle aisle. And then slip into about the second or third row and take a seat. And he was wearing a um, blue suit, a white shirt, and red tie, which is basically a uh, uniform for the uh, members of the Nation of Islam. So after the meeting, I reported back to the department that I felt I had just saw a dry run on Malcolm's life. And when that was going to go down, I wasn't sure. Malcolm did not expect to live another week. He promised to reveal the names of those plotting his death at next Sunday's meeting at the Audubon Ballroom. The night before he had said he didn't think it would be a good idea for us to come to the um, Audubon. And uh, then the next day he called and said that, that we could come and uh, I was very happy, you know, that I could go because I had not seen him in 24 hours. Uh, when my mother received the call for, from my father for us to all get together and come down to the Audubon, I knew that was different. That was a rhythm change by that time with all of the things that were going on. And... All the while, it was still an exciting venture to get ready and go see Daddy. And we got there. He was late. And we sat at a booth, uh, stage right, downstage right. Malcolm came in, and I escorted him from about the middle of the ballroom to the wings backstage. When I got there, I had noticed there were some people already present. And there was three people sitting on the first row. They were sitting there reading newspapers. Nobody's paying them any mind. And Malcolm was still in the back. Benjamin Goodman came out, and he opened up the meeting. I opened up for him, and he had sat down behind me, and he said, make it plain. Make it plain is, is the code word that he, he used for us to, to bring him forward. So anyway, I did. I brought Minister Malcolm forward. He didn't like a lot of ice and, you know, here's Minister Malcolm, the great and all that. He didn't like that. Just, just, just plain, you know. Then I heard a lot of shots and I looked up and these three that were sitting across the front are now working their way from Malcolm's right to Malcolm's left shooting at him I saw my husband falling back falling back he didn't bend, he just fell straight. And then I tried to, I forgot my children, I tried to get to him. I was facing the assassins, so I saw them stand up and take my father's life. An image that I wondered if I could have prevented it. 